It's the Kyle Hyman Show on Redeemer Radio. This is Kyle Hyman, and joining us to talk about his newest book, Doors in the Walls of the World, Signs of Transcendence in the Human Story, is Dr. Peter Kraft, professor of philosophy at Boston College. Thanks for being here, Dr. Kraft. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Why do you like philosophy so much? It's the love of wisdom. We need it. We're fools. If we don't know that, we're really fools. (laughs) Your book... The title is Doors in the Walls of the World, Signs of Transcendence in the Human Story. What does that mean? It means that there are two ways of looking at the world. The secular way is, well, it's just the sum total of all facts. And the religious way, which every culture in the past has embraced, is that there's more. That is just uh, a dimension, a uh, part, an appearance. That, as Hamlet says to Horatio, there are more things in heaven and earth that are dreamed of in your philosophy. Hmm. So, do you think some people focus more on walls than doors, and, and some people focus more on doors than the walls? Oh, yeah. Yeah, you can control a wall. It uh, doesn't move. You don't know what's on the other side of the door. It can be scary to open a door. Which brings up the topic of wonder. You talk about that in your introduction. What is wonder, and what role does it play in our human experience? Can you explain? Well, every little child has wonder. It's a natural uh, attitude towards the world, and our education sometimes educates us out of that wonder. So it does more harm than good in taking away the motive for exploration. And once we have that instinctive wonder or surprise that the world is, is more than we think, we then investigate it. As a result of our investigation, all the truth that we find is a cause for more wonder. Any good scientist knows that the more success you get in science, the more you realize that the world is, is far more unimaginable than you ever thought. Yeah. So that idea of kind of educating the wonder out of kids... How does that actually happen, and then how do we prevent that, do you think? Well, we can prevent it very powerfully on an individual level just by reacting against it. But the cultural conditioning is very, very strong. Science and technology is our our best pitch, so we go with it all the time. We're very, very good at it. But that demands a, a control and a kind of surrounding with the mind of, of the world, reducing it to a, to a thing and conquering it. There's a legitimate place for it. It's silly to uh, trash either science or technology. But if that's all we have, there are no doors and we're in a prison. You talked about philosophy not only beginning with wonder, but proceeds by means of wonder and ends in wonder. What do you mean by it ending in wonder? Well, let me give you an example. You might wonder how it is that we can see things that are far away. Uh And then you realize that all the scientific answers that we get to that question is just the mechanism. But it remains amazing that that chair on the other side of the room doesn't move, and yet an image of it comes from it to me, and I, who am over here, I see that thing that's over there. That's a very simple thing, that a thing can be in two places at the same time, on its four legs, standing on the floor, 20 feet away, and in my mind. And that's a cause for wonder. That, that leads to the realization that there's more involved here than just atoms and molecules. Yeah. So one of the things that you break down in the book is this idea of story and how that fits in with all of this. How did you, or when did you make this connection with story and what made you want to break this down in the book? Well, the book was at first a series of stories and images about transcendence and about these doors that lead to greater dimensions in the world. And then I realized that they all fit into, well, five different dimensions, and the five are are the dimensions of a story. Any story has a plot, characters, a setting, a theme, and style. So that's how I organized the book. And then you take that into not just uh, the story framework, but beyond that. Can you explain? Well, the characters, of course, are ourselves, but Mm -hmm. we're not alone. There's God, the main character. There are angels. There are the dead who are still living, ancestors. 
it's a vast cast of characters, and the plot, if it's if the story is worth telling at all, has a meaning, a point, and that point can be abstractly expressed in terms of a theme. What's life all about? What are we headed towards? And the setting is important too. The universe is the setting. The universe is a also a great work of art, greatest work ever created. God is the artist, so it's got a style. We're talking with Dr. Peter Kraft, the author of probably about a million books now. The most recent one, Doors in the Walls of the World, Signs of Transcendence in the Human Story. Why do you think that stories are so effective in helping us to think about and understand ideas? Because we're in one. Other works of art are outside of us, but in everything that we do, in art, in science, in ordinary living, we're forging our own story. This is why the Bible is such a realistic book. It's a book of stories, not just abstract general principles or techniques for having mystical experience, concrete stories of people who are like us and share our story with us. So then, how do these stories help us to understand God or explain God? Usually in an indirect way. Take the greatest book of the 20th century, according to four poles, The Lord of the Rings. God is not mentioned in there at all. There's no obviously religious dimension in it at all. Yet it baptizes the imagination, the presence of God, of divine providence, of, of a meaning, of a, a, a superior intelligence, of fundamental moral principles, of, of, of unselfish love. These are just manifested in the story. It doesn't have to be told, it has to be shown. That's what a story does. A sermon preaches and it tells you, but a story shows you. It's more convincing. So you talked about Lord of the Rings. What are some of the other stories that you talk about in the book? Well, some of them I made up myself. Some of them are from great pieces of literature. In a sense, a, a work of music is a story. It moves. Mm -hmm. And even static works of art, like a Gothic cathedral, is part of a story because it's the setting of a play. And the play is not relative to the setting. The setting is relative to the play. But also within the architecture, there's story of the design, right? Yes, yes. You, you see a dynamic, active mind alive. Things like cathedrals and symphonies don't just happen. The storyteller or the architect or the musician is inevitably present in, in his art. Do you have a favorite fiction story? Oh, so many of them. If you want a short story instead of a long one like The Lord of the Rings, let's take Hamlet, probably the greatest of all plays. got so many different dimensions in it. The style is so perfect that there are more quotations from Hamlet in Bartlett's familiar quotations than from any other book with a single title ever written except from the Bible. Huh. What do you like about the story of Hamlet? The fullness of it, it gives you the, the thickness and the mystery of both life and death and their interpenetration. Hamlet's father's ghost is present only in a few scenes, yet in another sense he's present in the whole story. And Hamlet is a character very much like ourselves, noble yet flawed, a demanding philosopher, yet someone who is in this mystery, this oppressive mystery that he can't fully make light of. It's the interplay between light and darkness, between appearance and reality, between truth and error. They're both present. Neither is, is, is denied. Of all the different stories that you share and break down in the book, uh, do you have to be familiar with these beforehand, or can you just kind of catch up with your description and, and run with that and, and your breakdown of it? Oh, it's not a scholarly book. Some of the stories will be unfamiliar, some will be familiar, and there's a certain angle that the reader can get from unfamiliarity that he can't get from familiarity. Hmm. So, in a sense, the uh, unread reader will be more shocked and brought into wonder than the reader for whom these stories are familiar. You mentioned the five aspects of the story, the plot, the setting, the characters, the theme, the style. And in your book, you talk about the theme being joy. Can you explain that? It's what we all want. Sometimes it's said that everybody searches for happiness, but in the modern sense of the word, happiness can be boring. It's just contentment, just the satisfaction of, of what we already desire. And that's not 
what we want because that bores us. If you took a piece of paper and wrote in two columns all the things that you want to be in heaven and in another column all the things you don't want to be in heaven and then imagined yourself going to heaven and experiencing all those things, after a few thousand years, I think it would be boring. <laughs> Uh, joy is a surprise. Joy is not just the satisfaction of what's in us. It's stuff coming into us from outside that we never suspected. And then that fifth aspect of a story, the style, you describe as art. Can you explain that? No. <laughs> art, is, art is unexplainable. Art is unlike science. Science, when it's perfect, is mathematical, and mathematics encloses everything, huh. and there's nothing ambiguous. Art always has a more, always has fuzzy edges, always has a, a delightful ambiguity. Art is like life. What do you hope people get from reading the book? The sense of transcendence, the sense of adventure, the sense that we should break our, our conventional bonds that surround our mind and put them into knots and make a dangerous journey up a narrow, ragged, rocky path out of Plato's cave into a world that uh, will make us stand blinking in wonder in the sun. When did you start to experience that yourself? I think in high school, reading great poets, and then in college, reading great philosophers. That, that image of Plato's cave is, is the most popular, uh, most deservedly popular image in the whole history of philosophy, because that's what happened to each of us when we were born. So it has to happen again and again. We were put in a cave? Yeah, it's called your mother's womb. Okay. It's, a, it's a narrow little world. And when we die, I think the same thing's going to happen to us. We're going to pop out of this narrow little 13.7 billion light year wide universe and look back at it and say, that was like a mother's womb. That was like a cave. There's so much more. I love it. All right, well, where can people get a copy of the book? Ignatius Press publishes it. It's uh, uh, available on Amazon or wherever books are sold. All right, again, it's called Doors in the Walls of the World, Signs of Transcendence in the Human Story. Thank you so much, Dr. Cray, for joining us today and sharing this with us. Appreciate it. You're very welcome. God bless you.